Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we've got probably a little bit longer video than I normally do, but I'm gonna to try to put a lot of information into this one. This is more of a Tech Talk style video. We're gonna talk about power cables. We're gonna talk about some of the misinformation out there on power cables and misinformation that's been posted about our power cables out there on YouTube. And then we're going to talk about how to set a system up that will allow you to hear the differences that power cables bring to the table and how you can repeatably get results and make good comparisons and make judgments on your own as to whether or not it's going to make a difference in your system and how much difference will it make in your system. So we're going to go through a lot here. So I'm going to back up. I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork, go back to um, some earlier emails, not emails, earlier videos that I shot to where I talk about cables. And then when I would do that, sometimes the guys over on the left, the guys at uh, ARS, ASR, ASR, would post a rebuttal video. It's like, they, they hate me over there because I'm teaching you guys how you can hear differences in cables and what differences there are in cables like power cables speaker cables interconnects usb cables you know everything matters even getting the cables up off the floor and they hate all of that those are the guys that um think that all cables sound the same if they don't measure any difference they can't possibly sound any different and all of that stuff and i know we've made fun of those guys in the past or we've kidded about those guys we've called them flat earthers and things like that all in good fun um, and a customer sent me cubicle globes and earth is not flat t-shirts and Amir who's the guy that does the measuring and stuff over there at ASR got him one of those t-shirts too and he wore it in one of the last videos about something of our uh, power cables and but there's some misunderstanding as to why why we call those guys flat earth guys um, the, the real reason is they are like those people in that they have a belief. They believe that all cables sound the same and they don't want to do any science or show, do any comparatives that might burst their belief system. It's kind of like the guys who believe the earth is flat. They don't want to hear any evidence to the contrary. So they're kind of, they have a belief system and that's it. And they won't do any, they won't do any science. And so those guys are kind of the same way. And we've, kitted around and called them flat earthers and all that stuff. So that's where that stuff came from. Today, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to make fun of those guys. That's not what this video is about. I'm going to help those guys and help you, hopefully all of you watching, understand all of this stuff. And we're going to go right back to some of those videos. And we're going to debunk some of that stuff using just some common sense because some of it was just crazy. And so... um. Let's go back. Um, I did some videos where I said that the power cables especially can give off electromagnetic interference. I mean, there's power running through these things. It's, it's got quite an EMI field. And if you have speaker cables or interconnects or something and you've got that stuff all bundled together and you've got them all next to each other, with electromagnetic interference from one to the other is going to affect the signal. And when it affects the signal, it's going to affect how things sound. And that is something that is well known in the industry. We know that, um, that one cable can affect the other if you put them next to each other. In fact, if you go to all the guys that install Ethernet cables and stuff for Internet through your house, they know they don't want to run that Ethernet cable alongside a power cable because it's going to affect the signal, even though that's an all-digital signal. It's going to put noise on that line and then when that digital signal has to be converted at the other end there's noise all over and it's going to affect it and they know if um if they're installing cables for direct tv or dish tv where you've got video um, signals run or you're running a um, cable through the ceiling from your projector to your source you don't run that stuff next to power cables that's just a known fact in the industry you, you know especially you don't ever want to run them through the same conduit you want them separated and you want some space between them so that they don't affect each other 
that's a given. Even in Mir admitted that all these cables have a field around them. They give off some electromagnetic interference. Everything in the world has noise. So I told everybody to separate your cables. I said, get your cables off of each other. Don't bundle them together. Don't run them alongside each other. Go ahead and separate them and get them apart so that you won't have that interference. And after I, after I did that video, I had a lot of people either comment in the video or shoot me emails and say, wow, that was, that was great advice. I went and did that and my system sounds better now. It sounds clearer. And it was free. I didn't have to do anything. It was great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We got lots of thank yous on that stuff. So Amir shot a video where he wanted to prove that the electromagnetic interference off of the power cables was negligible or nothing. And it wasn't going to affect anything that you put by it. So he shot a video and he plugged this into the wall and he didn't plug this into anything. He just left it hanging. <laughs> and so he was sticking cables next to it all along it and trying to measure the effect. And he wasn't getting any effect, of course. He was saying, see, this proves that this doesn't have any effect, blah, blah, blah. And everybody who knows anything realizes that if you don't plug it into anything, you don't have any current flowing through it, then you're not really creating a bunch of electromagnetic interference from it because you don't have any current going through there. So he took a lot of flack over that. People laughed at him. People made fun of him. People were sending me emails saying, you got to see this. You got to see this. Can't believe what this guy's doing. And um, I, I actually shot a video, a, a response, and I mentioned that stuff in there. And I didn't want to point out who he was. I didn't want to point the finger at him. I didn't want everybody to go look and laugh at Amir. And so I just made up a name. I just made up the name Mo. I just said a guy named Mo, and I didn't I didn't say who it was. Um, and so then Ron, my editor, ran with that, and he made a thumbnail that was hilarious, and it had the Three Stooges on it, and and everybody then immediately figured out it was a mirror, and everybody was laughing at a mirror, calling him a stooge, and I thought, wow, this went this went too far. You know, this isn't what this was about. I'm not here to make fun of a mirror. And I didn't want to draw attention to him to begin with. That's why I just made up a different name. And I felt bad about that. And I told Ron, I said, you know what? I want to just take that video down. It was a good video. There was a lot of information in there. It was very informative. But that wasn't my intent. And I told him to take it down. And I shot a new video that talked about that situation. And I apologized to Amir. Because the intent was not to make fun of him. So I'm going to try and stick with that. I'm not going to make fun of him. And um, following that, Amir kind of doubled down and he, he posted another video where he said, see, th there really is, you know, some electromagnetic interference coming off of this thing. And he took a circuit tester and he moved the tester to it. And, and of course, the, the circuit tester would go off when he got near it. And it was showing that it was live. I mean, you, anybody can take little circuit testers and use those to, to find out if a a line is live or not. The one he's using, all it's really doing is it's it's sensing the capacitance that's in the cable and it's letting you know that it's live. It's not showing that there's electromagnetic interference coming off of it or that's doing something. So I'm not really sure what what this you know what he's thinking was on that. He was at this point trying to prove that there was a measurable interference coming off of it. And he admitted that all cables have some interference coming off of them. If you've designed any audio equipment, you know how bad these things can be. You know, you get an AC cable next to some sensitive input signal and boom, you know, it picks up that. But before he was trying to convince everybody that there wasn't. So I, I don't know where he was going with any of that. So that's kind of some of the background on some of this. And then he ordered a cable from us and we saw the order come in from Amir for a four foot B24 power cable. And we laughed about it at the, at the shop and said, I bet he doesn't burn it in because <laughs> they require about 200 hours of burn in. And we tell everybody uh, that it needs burning. I think it's even on our website that you need to burn it in. And yes, it does have an effect. I know the guys over on the left there, those, those guys we called flat earthers, they don't believe that any cables burn in, but fact is the dielectric material has an effect on the electricity 
and it has to form and dielectric materials have different dielectric absorption ratings and things like that that those are known issues and it does change over time and kind of settle in um, so we thought maybe we should write him a note uh, but we thought no he's just going to refute that that's even a real thing anyway and we thought about writing a note and telling him to be sure and plug this end into something when he tests it but we didn't we just we just sent it out and we we joked about it and we knew there was a hit job coming and we were writing the script in our heads. We were saying, this is what's going to happen. This is, this is how this is going to turn out. And we were laughing about it. And we didn't, we didn't really care. I know he's going to try and, and do a hit on it. Um, but we didn't really feel like anybody's really watching this. You know, it's, it's a low percentage of people that are out there watching a mirror. And it really doesn't affect our sales. No big deal. So he did his video. We didn't really care. But as time went on, we've got more and more people that are saying, hey, I saw this video. And... And there was a lot of misinformation on there. And so I feel like it's best if, if we go back and touch on those things and correct some stuff and make it a tech talk style video. And let's, let's talk about the technical things and look at what was done in the video so that uh, we can confirm what's really happening and kind of debunk the myths. And so the first thing that he did was he uh, talked for quite a bit of time about how much longer the ground plug is than the other plugs. It's some, to him, it seemed like it was just way too long. But the truth is that with any high-end power cable, the ground plug is always longer. That's just a simple fact. And the reason so is when you plug this thing in, what they want is for the first thing that makes contact is the ground plug. You want it to be grounded before it makes any contact with power. And when you unplug it, you want the opposite. You want it to disconnect from the power and then disconnect from the ground. So on any high-end power cables, the ground is always longer. Now, he had a tough time getting this plugged into his plug. And granted, with some of the higher-end power cables, some of these are slightly thicker. And that's to help hold them when you put it into a plug. You want something that really holds well. They are a little bit thicker. And plugs are different, like from this Pass and Seymour plug here. Um, to, if you go to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot and you get the orange ones that are hospital grade, what the hospital grade ones are is it's, it's got more tension on whatever you plug into to hold it so that it, whatever you plug in doesn't fall out. Uh, same with some of these that Dave uses as Uberbus, these real high-end Furitech plugs. They have a little more hold and they're a little, it's a little stiffer sliding this thing in. So it doesn't surprise me when he says they, it was hard to plug something in. But then he said he noticed as he was plugging it in and, and plugging it in and back and forth that it was that it was it was putting scratches on the ends here. He was getting scratches, so that that became very obvious. Then he's got corrosion on his plugs. He's got something in there that's caused it to corrode. It's rough, and that rough textured surface is is putting some scratches on this polished copper. Um, what he really needed to do is he needed to go in and replace his plugs with something that's. A better quality plug and all the good plugs what they do is they actually have polished connections on the inside because you want as much surface contact as possible and these are polished as well because it makes a difference on the amount of uh, contact that it's making in there well he had a tough time plugging this thing in so so he just kept pushing on it and what happened was he broke it now what he broke was there's a copper sleeve that goes over this whole thing and it acts as part of the shielding mechanism. That copper sleeve is not part of the ground plane. It is part of the recipe that helps make it do what it does. Well, he just shoved it on there until he broke the glue on it and then it was just sliding back and forth. He's the only one that's broken one so far. Now, any of you guys, if you did have a situation like that where the sleeve has come off, send it back to us, we'll fix it. Or you can glue it back on yourself. It's it's not that big a deal. Um, of course, he went ahead and talked about how thick it was. And, of course, you know, the thicker it is, obviously, the better it's going to be because it's so thick. The reason it's thick is we've got this big rope going through the center of it. And it's separating the, the counter-rotating geometry on it. So when you, when you get this, when this cable comes in, it's like this. It's, it's got counter-rotating um, positives and negatives going around it. And then we feed that rope through and it opens those up and it causes them to crisscross at a higher angle and it decreases the capacitance of the cable. It 
helps reduce noise further and it sounds better. And then we feed a ground wire through the center of the copper rope, um, through the cotton rope, and that's how these things are made. And that's the reason they're as big as they are and a little bit stiff. There's a, there's a lot there for it. So that's the, those aspects of it. You know, I'd also like to say that I don't always disagree with Amir. Amir brings up some good points sometimes, and I do agree with him on some things. Like he mentioned before that just because you're an engineer doesn't mean you understand all this. And Frankly, even engineers sometimes don't understand this. You know, we get taught all this stuff in school with no connection to reality. And he's correct. You know, just because you went to college and you passed all your courses and you got your certificate at the end that says you, you've, you've graduated, here's your diploma, that doesn't trump someone who's spent years in a field actually learning and has practical experience. Practical experience is always something that's going to be um, at a little higher level than someone who just got a college degree. That's not the same thing. So I, I agree with Amir on that situation. Um, but there's still, he, he had some misunderstandings and he didn't understand why we would take a cable that's this big that's, um, that breaks down to about an eight gauge cable. Why would we recommend putting this on the front end gear versus, you know, versus power amps where a power amp's drawing a lot more current. So you think, well, you want bigger cables on your power amps because they're drawing more current. And to some degree, that's true. You know, I agree with him on that part. Um, most power amps don't draw a lot of current. You can get by with our B16 on a lot of power, power amps, and you may not notice a big difference between the two cables. Uh, but if you do have a big power amp that draws a lot of current, then absolutely you know, go for the B24s. But why are we recommending it on a piece of gear that draws very little current at all and works at, you know, millivolts? Um, the reason being is there's noise on that AC line. When that noise comes in uh, from that AC line and it goes straight to your first thing, which may be either your streamer or your DAC, that's where your audio signal is transferred from a digital domain to an analog domain. And if there is noise on the power supply, there's noise in that transformation there, that noise is then there and it gets sent onto your preamp and your amp and that noise gets amplified. Sometimes the biggest gains can be made when you remove all that noise from your source and then from your preamp and then your amplifier. If, if the noise isn't there, then you don't have that much to amplify. But if the noise is already there, You've got nothing on your, you know, on your DAC other than a cheap power cable, and it's loaded with AC noise, and then it goes to your preamp, and then that gets amplified, or it gets sent then to your amps, and that gets it's it's bad news. So yeah, it makes more difference sometimes. And the 24 braid has a bigger, larger number of of uh wire going through there that's a higher filter than our b16 so that's why we recommend that on uh, your front end gear and i know even though we recommended that amir did not do that he used it on his preamp and so he did some things where he made some recordings he did an audio recording with one power cable and an audio recording with our power cable but just on the preamp and he and he he, he uploaded those to where you could you could download the file and you could listen to them. And I had a lot of emails from people and even some people responded in the, in the video that said, I clearly hear a difference between those two. People were emailing me saying, hey, between those files he just made, even though he just used it on his preamp, you can hear the difference in the playback. And I wish he would have used it maybe on the front end, it would have made more difference, but it is what it is. All right, let's talk a little bit about what Amir did in trying to compare some power cables. He did what's called null testing. And what he what the, the concept is was he would take a recording using a regular power cable and then take that same recording using our power cable. And then you'll do something where you you flip the polarity on one recording versus the other recording, and you'll line that stuff up so that the music then cancels itself out. And the difference that's left would be the noise floor that's there that's different between 
one power cable and the other power cable. So we're creating a difference that should be there. We're saying, yeah, there's a, there's a difference there in noise floor. So he set something up to show what that difference might be. However, there was quite a bit of flaw in that whole concept. And, and let's back up and talk about where does that come from? You know, flipping the polarity on something and then reflipping it. That's something that we see um, in the pro market quite a bit. And they figured out originally that whenever they were running long interconnects from the stage to a mixing board and they've got long power cables that are in close proximity to it and things like that, those long runs of cable become really big antennas. Now, it's not as big of a problem for us as we're reproducing this stuff in our audio systems because our cables are not that long. So they're less of an antenna, but they're still an antenna. They're still transmitting a lot of noise, and it's still a problem even at our level. But in the pro market where runs of cable can be 150, 200 feet, it's a big problem. It picks up a lot of noise, and it's a known fact that that noise affects the audio signal. It affects how it sounds because it's affecting the actual transfer of the signal that you want on there, and you've got all this other noise on there that's interfering with it. So what they do is they, they run what's called a balanced cable. And now most of you understand how a balanced cable works. Some of you may not. I'm going to explain it really quickly. Balanced cable has three plugs. It's got a ground. It's got two legs that are carrying the audio signal. And those two legs work like this. One has the standard signal, just like we would send through a balance, I mean a single end of cable. The other one has that same signal on it, but they flip the polarity on it. So when they flip the polarity on it, it's running out of phase from the other side. So it goes down to wherever they're taking it, you know, a hundred and something feet away, and it's picked up a lot of noise. It, it's, it, it's a big antenna, and it's picked that stuff up. And then when it gets to the other end, what they do is they flip that polarity back on one leg and now it's in phase with the first leg. But then the noise that it picked up from point A to point B is now out of phase and that noise cancels itself out. Now it's not perfect. It doesn't cancel out everything. I mean, you've got two wires there that are side by side and you've got, let's say, radio frequency interference that it's picking up. It's picking up every radio station there is. Well, those wavelengths are really short and some of them arrive at one wire at a slightly different time frame than the other and when you flip them flip the polarity it didn't completely cancel all that stuff out uh they're the two wires are close together but there's still some difference there but you know not a lot but there's still some it's not perfect the other issue with going to balance cable and i don't know a lot of you think well i'll just put balance cable on my system and and it, it won't pick up noise well it won't pick up additional noise but noise that's already there, noise that's already in your system because maybe you didn't use any good power cables, that noise is still being transmitted through both of those lines and it didn't go away. So you flip the polarity on it, you flip the polarity on that noise, then you flipped it back and it's still in phase. Versus some of our interconnect that we use that has this counter rotating geometry on it, it's not working so much as a shield or as uh, balance cables, but it's working as a filter. So what it's doing is the noise that's already on there, it's filtering some of that noise out, just like what our power cables do, just like what some of these cables do that we use as speaker cables. Um, it's working as a filter, even a mirror admitted on there that once we do that counter rotating geometry because of the, the geometry of it, that it becomes a filter. Yes. The weave that they have, does provide some some cancellation or you could say maybe generation, but uh, it certainly is doing what it says it's doing. You know, I just want to say what's fair is fair. They talk about the geometry and there is science behind that geometry being good for noise. So what happened then with his null test? Why is that null test null and void? I know he made you think that it was really sharp. Okay, it was doing a smart null, but the whole thing wasn't smart at all. And I'll tell you why. And I'm going to tell you in a way that where you can understand it. And I'm going to go to the shop and I'm going to show you some noise levels and I'm going to illustrate it. And it's going to be very clear and very evident. When you take a recording and it doesn't matter what the power cable was, you could use the same cable 
both times. You make a recording and then you make a second recording and then you take those two recordings and you superimpose them on themselves and you flip the polarities on everything. You're going to cancel out everything that lines up. Problem is the noise doesn't line up. Noise is not constant and it's not the same. Noise is doing this. So you got this noise going on on one recording and you got this noise going on on another recording. And when you flip the polarities on those, they don't cancel each other out. In fact, let's go to the shop and let's look at an illustration and it'll become very clear. All right, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna illustrate noise levels. And we're gonna do so by looking at noise levels in the room. So what we have here is I've got the, the camera focused on the screen and I'm gonna be showing you guys an RTA measurement, which is a real-time measurement with the microphone pointed out into the room. It's about four feet away from me and pointed out into the room. So what we're seeing here is you can see my voice. You can see how it's picking up my voice even though it's a directional mic and it's turned completely away from me. And if I'm quiet, you can see it go back down. This is just standard room noise. And it's very similar to noise that you're going to get in anything. AC noise, uh, RF signals, all of that. It's very random. So I'm going to be real quiet for a moment, let it settle, and then I'm going to capture it. All right, I've captured one here, and I'm going to turn it green so we can see it a little bit better. And then we're going to do it again. It's randomly moving again. Again, you can see my voice moving it. I'm going to get quiet again and let's capture it again. All right, now let's turn this one red. Now, as you can see, not much of it lines up. I mean, there's some things that are going on there that are on top of each other. Uh, but if we look, there's, there's red lines that are going in one direction and green lines going in another. And there are some areas where they line up and then there's a whole bunch of areas where they don't. So let's pretend that we just captured all of this in an audio recording. We captured the noise level and then we, we did another audio recording and captured the noise level again. Obviously those noise levels are all random and none of them line up. So if we flip the polarity on one versus the other to try and cancel it out, there are some areas like right in here where there's a red line and a green line on each other. So that would kind of represent a wavelength that is arriving in phase and then when you flip the polarity it would cancel out but there's a lot of peaks and things where you've got a red line on one side and then opposed from it you've got a green peak on the other those are similar to things that would arrive out of phase so they're out of phase or out of time with each other when they arrive and so when you flip the polarity over on each other what you're going to get is a new peak because you're going to get one plus one equals two and you're going to get a new peak somewhere and you're going to get a greater range of noise than you would normally get if you were just looking at a single. In other words, you could get some of these peaks that line up after you flip the polarity that become taller than they were to begin with. So you're going to get one plus one equal two kind of a situation. Whereas again, some of these areas you'll get cancellation, but it's going to look just as rough, um, after you flip the polarity on it as it does before you flip the polarity on it and it, it's possible that by flipping the polarity onto the noise and laying it over on itself you could get a greater range of noise a higher db range that's just the way it works that's just how random this stuff really is all right hopefully that was fun and that made sense and everybody understands how noise levels are never constant they're not linear they're moving around all the time so you can't do a null test on noise levels you're just going to get more noise and i know when he took that um those captures that he did there he had a pretty big range of of level there and you could see in blue there what was representing the noise that was he was picking up but he cropped all that out he only used a 93 db range so everything that was going on below that he just physically cropped it out. And then he he said, well, let's let's hear if we hear a difference between one recording and another. You know, and he uploaded the files. Of course, a lot of people said they could hear the difference, but he's listening on earbuds. And I can tell you now, you're, you're not gonna hear the differences on earbuds 
uh, like you can if you have a whole system set up. And I'm going to come back to that. We're going to really talk about that. Um, and then he reversed it on itself and then said, now, can you hear the difference? Uh, well, he cropped all of it out. All the noise level was cropped out, so you weren't going to hear anything. Um, so that whole test was null and void. That was ridiculous. Uh, the other thing he did was he used our power cable as an interconnect. Like, why are you using it on a low power source? Why don't you plug it into the wall and measure everything that you're picking up on that cable? Measure all the noise level, all the RF noise, everything. And then do the same with the cheaper cable and see how much difference there is. How about that? That would be an easy test to do. Uh, but now he uses it as an interconnect. And even using it as an interconnect, he noted that there was a 20 dB difference in noise level between our power cable and the other power cable that he was testing. 20 dB in noise level is quite a bit. And that's, that's using it on interconnect. That's not even looking at all the RF noise and the electromagnetic interferences and things that it's designed to actually filter out that you're not even going to see using it as an interconnect. But the fact that there's 20 dB difference there is really significant. So Amir, thank you very much for pointing all that out. Unfortunately, this is where they do know science over there is they've got it. They've got some data and then they theorize the result. Here's where they theorize the result. He says, okay, that's below the level of what we can normally hear. So there's going to be no effect. Well, in order to conclude if there's going to be an effect or not, you've got to set something up and actually listen. You're going to have to do some comparative listening to know if it's going to have any effect or not. So I'm going to help kind of walk you guys through how you can set something up and so that you can definitively hear a difference. And you're not going to hear it listening to, listening to the differences on earbuds because you're handicapping yourself so much. Even Amir noticed that when people talk about swapping out these power cables, it's like the whole sound stage opens up. If you look at the uh, you know, uh, marketing material for a lot of interconnect cables or speaker cables, they claim how much noise immunity they have, and as a result, that opens up the sound and darker backgrounds and all that stuff. You know, there's more layering, there's more space, there's more everything. Of course there is. I mean, that's the, some of the differences that it makes. When you... When you remove a lot of the noise from the AC system there and you now have a clean audio signal, it preserves what I call spatial cues. It's the things that create the space around instruments and stuff. It, it preserves the upper level harmonics. It preserves the decay structure that's on each note so it doesn't get smeared and just go away. You can actually hear the decay of those notes and you hear space between notes and you hear the difference in spaciousness. You're not going to hear differences in soundstage layering listening on a pair of earbuds. It's just not going, to, not going to happen. You may hear differences in some clarity. You're going to hear um, some slight differences, but not if, and not like you will if you put it into a big system. In a full-size system, there you may even hear differences in the vocal region. Vocals are more fluid, fluid and less smeared. Uh, bass response is tighter, cleaner, digs deeper. Uh, more extended. I mean, there's a whole lot of differences that this stuff brings to the table when you've got good, clean power running to everything. So the way to notice this stuff is you have to be able to set up a system that's going to allow you to hear these things. In other words, you need an audio system that's one going to have good, good speakers, not speakers loaded with electrolytic capacitors and iron core inductors and sand cast resistors and cabinets that vibrate. And, you know, all those things are going to do away with all that decay structure and all that uh, spatial cues that are there in the music. Your, your speaker has to be able to reproduce it. It can't be, you know, a, a, a $200 speaker. I mean, you're going to have to, you're going to have to have a reasonable quality level there that the speaker is not disrupting the audio signal. Next, you have to have your speakers pulled out into the room. You can't cram the speakers up against the wall and expect to create a three-dimensional sound stage. It's going to reflect right off the wall and it's going to sound as if it's just all coming from the wall. That's just a simple physics of it. To create a three-dimensional sound stage, to some degree, you're going to have to get your speakers off the wall. That reflection off the wall is going to have to be heard and perceived as a delay, not as part of the signal. Um, 
you're going to have to be in a room, preferably that's not bare walls. If you've got reflections going on all over the place and those reflections in the room, they're going to disrupt your system's ability to create a soundstage. You need a reasonably well-treated room. The more the room is treated and the more diffusion and absorption you got in there to where you're not listening like your head's in a barrel, then the greater your system is going to be in it being able to recreate a three-dimensional soundstage. That's just simple, bare-bones, basics, physics of it, whatever you want to call it. That's the facts. And it, it also matters what other cables you're using in your system. I mean, if you're using the, the interconnect that came with your VCR that you bought in the 80s, I mean, chances are you got a lot of improvement ahead. Same with speaker cables. If you're using zip cord, <laughs> you got a lot of improvement ahead. So if you've taken a lot of that stuff into account, you've got a properly set up system to where now you can hear a three-dimensional soundstage. Now, spend your money on power cables and it's going to be money's well spent. You're going to get some of those jaw-dropping uh, responses where you, you listen to it and you think, oh my goodness, the whole soundstage just opened up. Absolutely. A veil has been lifted off of everything. Yep, yep, that's what happens. And you can go back and forth and you can listen and you can get repeatable results easily, easily. But you have to be able to re recreate that stuff. When my customers ask me about power cables, first thing I do is ask them about their system. You know, how big is your room? How far are your speakers out in the room? How do you have it set up? Do you have any room treatment in your room? You know, a lot of people just aren't ready to go down that path of upgrading their cables. You know, and granted, to some degree, they'll still benefit from upgrading their speaker cables and things. They're going to hear differences in clarity, uh, differences in texture and tone and bass response and things like that. But where the real differences come in play is in the sound stage and how open and how deep and how layered things are. You're just not going to get that from earbuds, guys. You're going to have to set that system up to where you can hear it and then it's going to make a difference. So I hope you guys enjoyed this dive into the technical aspects of this stuff if you got questions shoot them over to me in an email or post them below um i always appreciate you guys comments and we'll see you guys in the next one oh sorry about that didn't know you were sitting there